Hello and welcome. So I wanted to take just a second to talk to you about a man who controlled areas of Latin America or in a particular area of Latin America um, once by being elected and once by force. And um, this man was in control before Fidel Castro took control. So let's talk about Fulgencio Batista. Fulgencio Batista, most of us just refer to him as Batista, okay? So he was born in 1901 and he was a young, um, as a young kid, his family was not all that wealthy. I mean, they were, they were uh, sugar farmers, um, sugar cane, you know, was a big deal in Cuba. And so the sugar farmers really didn't make all that much money. I mean, they were kind of like lower class, middle to lower class society. Um, he was, he had a bunch of brothers and sisters. I believe he had like four siblings and um, he was one of the main ones to take care of those siblings. Um, he ended up dropping out or finishing school in the fourth grade. I know that sounds really crazy now, but fourth grade then was, was a little bit different than it is now, a lot different actually. Um, we're talking the early 1900s here. And the whole world, we know that the 1900s, especially when it comes to, um, to the European side and the Eastern hemisphere is involved in World Wars I and II. But on the Western side of the hemisphere, they had other things going on. That doesn't mean that they weren't affected by those wars because they definitely were. Um, but particularly in Cuba, they're focused on the sugarcane production. Um, of course, trade is gonna be affected a big time by the wars and especially by the Great Depression that ends up happening both in um, really the whole world, but, but in Europe first after World War I and then also in um, the United States with the, with the stock market crash as well. So Flagencio Batista um, was, a, was, a, was a young man and his mother died actually at 15 years old. So he was 15 years old and his mom died and he didn't really get along with his dad very well. And so he actually um, like moved away from home and he lived in all different kinds of places all over the cities throughout Cuba. Um, and he just worked small jobs, did they, anything he could to make ends meet. He's actually homeless for a little while, um, so the story goes. He didn't really have a great relationship with his dad at this time. You know, he was a teenager. He wasn't getting along with his, um, with his dad too well. And so he was kind of rebelling against being at home and whatnot. Um, he ends up joining the army. So he does, he does help out his dad. He does work on the sugar plantation. Um, that's actually working for not, uh, not a plantation so much as a sugar like corporation, okay? So he does help his dad out with that. And then he ends up joining the army. So, you know, by now he's like mid twenties, you know, like we're talking late twenties, 1920s, 1930s. In the 1930s, he ends up joining the army. And in the army, he all of a sudden is standing out as this like great leader. I mean, he was, he, he could speak very well. Um, he was extremely great organizer. Um, he, people just, just really, really liked him. And when he was 32 years old, um, he had actually a pretty high rank in the army. And he actually was one of the main leaders in this big revolt that happened in 1933. And so after this, the people that were with him um, that saw him, you know, through this were like basically made him chief of staff and basically just put him in control. And so with some of his army buddies, so to say, were like, hey, you know, like our country's not doing all that great with their government. So maybe you should leave. OK, so Batista, when he was when he was younger, really kind of felt like he was kind of a nobody. But then as he got in the military and as he got some status and he got some people looking up to him, his whole like outlook changed. OK, so let me just step back just a little bit and tell you a little bit about what Cuba is like during this time. So at this particular time, sorry, it was tingled in my, my headphones. At this particular time in Cuba, um, Cuba's doing great financially, but I will tell you that the prices because of the Great Depression and whatnot, the prices of the sell of sugar have started to go down. And so sugarcane is the number one export of Cuba and really how they make all their money or how they made all their money. And so Batista is, even though Cuba is doing fantastic, um, Batista sees that the government really needs to step it up and really needs to kind of figure out what to do with these exports and start to kind of like keep the sugar plantations going strong because they're just not really anymore. And the current government's not really doing anything about it. So to give you just a little insight about some things that are going on in Cuba too, Cuba has one of the highest literacy rates in the entire world. This is the beginning of the 1900s. Like we'll say, we'll say like, 
20s, 30s to like 1950s, okay? They have one of the highest literacy rates, even higher than the United States and most European countries, okay? They, not only do they have the high literacy rate, they also um, have a really good GDP, more or less. Um, of course, their numbers did go down with the sell of um, the sugar going down. But they were doing pretty well. I mean, as a country, this was a, was a very lavish country, a lot of great cities with a lot of really strong infrastructure, a lot of like city things, jobs, stuff like that. And so Cuba is not really hurting. I mean, they're not one of the lower, you would not consider it a lower country in the world. Okay, pretty good deal. Well, Batista though sees that the government's not really doing things right. I mean, the government was pretty corrupt. The government wasn't really um, helping out the exports with the sugar and trying to keep that going. And really the governments, were just, they just stunk. I, I don't know any other way to put it. They weren't helping matters for Cuban people, okay? So Batista and his crew decide, hey, wait a second. You know, he can handle things pretty good in the army. Let's just, maybe he should be in control here. So Batista runs for president. So in 1940, he runs for president and he wins. He wins, okay? He's a great dynamic speaker. People love him. He's very good with, um, with administering things. Like he's very organized. Um, people believe what he says, you know? And they're, they're pretty fed up with what he's doing with all of this sugar cane and that things like that, or not him, but the previous government. So they're looking for a change, okay? So Batista, they think is gonna come in and is gonna save everything, is gonna make everything great. Mm, doesn't really so much happen, but at least they think that that's what's gonna happen. So Batista comes in and is elected as president in 1940. Well, you think that that's going to be awesome. You know, he comes in as president, but he doesn't really do much. And through all of my research, I haven't really found much that's made him stand out as a president. He kind of did things the same way all the people before him did. So all of these like promises that he made to the people just really didn't follow through. Okay. So another president that had run against him in 1940 runs against him again. And this time he realizes... He's not even, it's not really even worth him rerunning for president. This other guy, um, he's going to win. So I might as well just go ahead and just let him win, back off, give over, you know, the country to him and basically leave. Well, he doesn't just do that and just give up the country. In a, in, when the other guy wins, the other guy takes over. His name was Guru, something like that. Anyway, when he wins and he takes over, he ends up, Batista actually is kind of like, bummed, I guess. I guess you could say bummed that he wasn't really the favorite, that he wasn't able to do the things that he wanted to do. And he ends up moving to the United States. Okay. Now he had become very wealthy in Cuba because, you know, you don't really like leave a presidency very poor. And so typically, so he takes all of his money and all of his riches and all of the things that he's earned in Cuba and then just moves to the United States. And he actually goes and lives in Daytona beach, Fort Lauderdale, that kind of area. And he buys a beach house. Um, he moves there with his second wife, and they start a life in as a United St in the United States. Um, they actually live a fairly lavish life. They they live a life of the wealthy, um, and he becomes really close and really good buddies with a lot of the American mafia. Now, this is in the 1940s and 1950s. Of um, we're talking like 1945 through like 1950 two or 1950, something like that. Anyway, while he's living there, he becomes really close with a lot of the um, New York mafia. He's kind of hangs out with mobsters. He hangs out with the wealthy. Um, he just becomes buddies with a lot of high-class criminals, I guess is the best way to put it, in the United States. Well, in the midst of that, he starts to kind of get a big head. You know, he starts to, starts to get a little full of himself and he decides, my Cuban people need me back. You know, they just can't get a government that's going to take care of things for them. And, you know, I may not have done things right the first time. And I may not have been able to do all the things that I want to do, but I'm going to come back for a second term and I'm going to make changes again. And they're going to love me. <laughs> Had he only known they were not going to love him, but maybe he was just kind of stuck up by that point And he just didn't want to believe that they wouldn't love him. Okay. So anyway, he, he runs for president again. And he's a little bummed because the first time he had a lot of support from the people and it seemed like he was like the sure in the win. And this time people aren't really, he's not the number one choice. 
um, at all. In fact, some of the people that are winning in the candidacy above him are actually people that um, Fidel Castro would have supported. They would have been, they were not Fidel Castro personally, but it's the party that he would have, would have supported. So he is like a distant third when it comes to the election. He's definitely not going to win. And just a few weeks before the election, he's like, can't, you know, just usually when a candidate would kind of be like, okay, okay, I get it. I've lost, you know, I got to back out. Yeah, Batista doesn't, he's not really the kind of got to back out. Remember, he's been hanging out with gangsters. He's been hanging out with um, people who tend to get things the way they want it, whether it's necessarily the right thing or not. And so he gathers a lot of his kind of mobster friends and gangster friends and high society people from both the USA and from Cuba. A lot of the people that he was in the military with, um, they, those people had been stripped of their rights and stripped of their, I don't say rights, but stripped of their leadership after Batista had left being president the first time and they would like to get back into power. And so he makes a bunch of promises to them. That's like, Hey, you know what? We'll take over. We'll get into power again. And I'll, you know, make you, you know, high society again. We'll, I'll, I'll put you back into a place of, of influence and of leadership, whatnot. Anyway, he gets this group of people together. He basically creates his own army and they effectively overthrow the government. Okay. Now they do this in like a matter of like an hour and 15 minutes. In fact, he brags about it in interviews afterwards that it only took an hour and 15 minutes before the current government was waving the white flag of surrender. So basically all these mobsters, I mean, if you know about gangsters and whatnot, which I hope you don't know much about them, but just in thinking about what you see in movies and stuff, they don't typically like, they don't typically back down. Okay. So, and they're usually pretty threatening. So you think about, you know, they're showing up at these government officials houses and, and buildings and all these like government places, these um, transportation hubs, um, all of these places where the government would have had a high control and would have had a high presence. And they're literally like scaring them. I mean, who knows? We don't know the exact story if they were held at gunpoint. We don't know what was happening, but there were some security guards that were, were killed. Okay. And there were a whole lot of other people that were probably held at gunpoint. Um, and there were a lot of people that were just threatened. And so the government was weak anyway. They weren't really, you know, like I said before, the governments were not really doing very much. They were, didn't have much control. They were inexperienced, et cetera. And so they were like, okay, it's not worth my life. And so they end up pulling back and waving the white flag of surrender. And they're scared of Batista and his army. Okay, so they're basically freaking out and they're pretty scared of this new dude because he's scary. Okay, and he's not totally new, but you know, he's come in. So just a few weeks before the election, this guy who was running now has taken over the government by force and completely overthrown the current leadership completely. Okay, in fact, the current leadership is so scared of him that they actually go and take exile in Mexico. They go to Mexico City and hide, okay, at the Mexican embassy because they don't even feel safe in their own country anymore of Cuba. Okay, so kind of crazy, but that's what that's how it works out. Well, anyway, he goes and he, um, Batista is now in control. And like I said, it's just a couple of weeks before the election. And so the people are in an uproar, like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? You know, this, this crazy group now has taken over the government and they're in charge and blah, blah, blah. And he says, no more elections, the election's not happening, okay? And I am now dictator. I am in full control. I'm putting myself in power. I will be the one to make changes. You gotta talk to somebody, you're gonna talk to me. So I kind of, in my, in my mind, for the period of this world geography class for sixth grade, I like to refer that back to when we talked about Hitler. You know, when Hitler came into power, he kind of snuck his way in, kind of manipulated his way in. Admittedly, it wasn't through a big military, you know, like, um, you know, fearful guns and faces kind of thing. It wasn't an overthrow, but he did kind of sneak his way in and manipulate his way in. And when he got in, he said, hm, no more elections and I'm in charge now, okay? And if you don't like it, okay? So that's kind of what Batista did too. Now, Batista and Hitler were two completely different people that ruled in completely different ways. So please do not relate them as people and as characters as the same, but you can relate their actual coming into power those things do have some parallels, okay? So Batista's in full control now. He is president, he's dictator. There are no more elections. And now we have the people of Cuba. Now, if you remember, I told you that Cuba was, was doing pretty well. They just didn't really, weren't handling the sugarcane 
um, very much because sales were down. You know, sales will come back up. I mean, it's just a matter of the depression and whatnot. Now we're getting to the 1950s when people are recovering from the depression pretty well. People are spending money. Um, Cuba was doing great, great. I mean, they, they really were. Um, Cuba was one of the first countries in the world to have color TV, um, electricity. Um, they were one of the first countries in the world to, um, to have like, uh, what else, the color TV stations. They had more radio stations than pretty much anybody but Russia. I mean, these are the kind of things that were Cuban life, okay? Cuba was a huge, huge tub for travel for the USA. Now, if you were really, really wealthy in the USA, it would be very likely that you would travel down to Cuba to, um, to live it up, you know, to dance, to party, to um, vacation, beautiful beaches, you know, the Caribbean, beautiful weather, et cetera, et cetera. So Batista capitalized on that, okay? Because you remember he had been hanging out with gangsters in the, in the United States. So he wanted to get the wealthy people in Cuba because there used to be a pretty strong wealthy class in Cuba. Um, and he, he wanted to get the wealthy class in Cuba much, much, much wealthier. So what he did was he decided that he would, or he told people that he would match dollar for dollar for every hotel that would be invested in. If every investor, you know, somebody who had a lot of money would put money into hotels that would have casinos, then he would actually um, match that with government money. That in and of itself sounds pretty corrupt. I mean, giving government money into gambling doesn't really sound all that pure at heart, but that's kind of the way that Batista did things. And so he basically turns Cuba into a, a place very much like Las Vegas. Now at this time, Las Vegas didn't exist, but Cuba became like a Las Vegas. People were going there and just blowing money like crazy. I mean, casinos all over the place. It was like the party and joints to be. This is all in the 1950s. Lots of money flowing in and out from tourists all over the entire world, all coming to Cuba. Um, lots of um, mob mentality type stuff. Batista, the way of handling like his secret service and his military and stuff, the way that they would tend to handle things was if they didn't like what, you, what somebody was saying or they felt like somebody was going to go against them. They kind of handled it more like a gangster would, you know, instead of like a politician should. And they, a lot of people were killed. Um, Batista was known to be very, very rough dictator. Um, and he definitely wanted to make the rich people richer. And he really just didn't care about the poor people. He pretty much used them as laborers to continue to work the fields and didn't really do much to take care of them. People were literally not able to feed their families. And it was, it was a really bad situation. So that then sets the stage for someone else to come in and say, hey, Batista, stop. Like, you can't be doing this anymore. We now, as the people of Cuba, want to have our country back. Stop. And so that's going to set the stage for somebody to come in and actually overthrow Batista. Who do you think that might be? Exactly, Fidel Castro. Now, remember I told you that um, one of the um, opponents that Batista ran against in the second presidential election would have been who Fidel would have probably sided with, okay? So Fidel was already like, I can't take over Batista in a means of like some kind of a legal, you know, overthrow. Like, I can't beat him in an election because, well, first off, there are no elections, so that's not really an issue. But Fidel had the support of the people of Cuba. But he also knew that, it, that Batista and his mobsters, more or less, would, a secret service, would find some way to kill him if they saw him. So Fidel hid in the mountains with a whole army of his own and basically step by step and sneak attack by sneak attack um, came through and, and eventually did actually overthrow Batista and that current government. Um, and Fidel did come in to power and did overthrow Batista. Batista ended up um, leaving the country again, um, but this time he, uh, he tried to go back to the USA and the USA said, mm -mm, sorry, um, you can't come back here. You can now go and live in Europe. And so he ends up going and living in Europe where he lived a pretty lavish life. You know, he had a, he still had all that money he had been packing up. It's not like anybody ever just took his bank account from him. Okay. And he goes and lives there until he's in his seventies and dies. Okay. So, um, Batista ruled Cuba for two different sessions, once as a four-year presidency, and then once as a dictator for about eight years. Um, and excuse me, six years from 1952 to 1958 when, um, Fidel Castro came in and um, won the hearts over of the people and obviously, um, you know, overthrew the current government of Batista as well. 
So I hope that this has taught you just a little bit about this crazy character in Cuba. Um, he's little known. A lot of Cuban history is actually kind of difficult to find information on, at least reliable. Cuban history is difficult because Cuba after this with Fidel Castro actually became a communist country. And so in the midst of becoming a communist country, a lot of their um, history, a lot of their um, information that we would learn from is hidden and is, is not published. And so that does make it to where you don't get to learn that much about Batista. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about this man um, instead of uh, show you some kind of video or something like that. So if you have any questions, you know how to reach me. Thanks.